Hey there, Jordan Jared and not live, not live on a Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019. Hope everyone's having a splendid, splendid day. Uh, we missed you yesterday, but we were working on a story that we published today that we're going to talk about uh, that uh, whew, Democratic National Committee neutral, they say. Well, we'll see what you think if the Democratic National Committee is neutral based on uh, who they just hired as finance chair. Uh, so we're going to get into that big league, bigly. Um, and we're also going to get into, uh, boy, is the corporate media attacks against Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard. I mean, you can't really distinguish between the New York Times and the Daily Beast and their propaganda against progressive anti-war candidates and like super PAC ads attacking Sanders or Tulsi Gabbard. I, I can't tell the difference. So we're going to go over that. And we have some super, super exciting, exciting announcements uh, to tell you. Uh, but we'll get to all that later. Remember, checklist, smash the like button. Smash it like it is Tom Perez coming to the beach with you and your friends, telling you to lead with your values. Smash it like it's Nancy Pelosi wasting all of our time trying to impeach Donald Trump, which will end up electing Donald Trump for another four years. Smash the like button. Like it is Joe Biden. Well, I was going to say something crude, but I'll refrain. Just smash it like it's Joe Biden telling you he's middle class Joe. More people that press the like button, the more people that will see this non-live stream. Become a status quo member. Folks, I'm not going to lie to you. I always keep it real. We are pretty stagnant at the moment. Pretty stagnant. We've been at 409 for a couple days now. So uh, for those of you watching that are not status quo members, I hope by the end of this non-live stream, once you see the report we just published today, uh, once you see some of the things we're working on, you will become a status quo member for as low as 5 to $10 a month. What is real journalism? Real independent journalism worth to you? Is it worth five to ten to twenty dollars a month? I think it is. It's worth that to me. And I am the founder, co founder, and CEO of Status Coup. So trust me when I tell you, I would become a member if I had the money. So well, I've already sunk quite a lot of my money <laughs> into the company. So uh, $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month, or $179 annually. And what you get as a member, and we're doing it tonight, 7.30 Eastern, so right after this live stream, you get a monthly video call with us. So tonight, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific, uh, Jen and I will be uh, joining you through Zoom. It is a video call, so uh, we will have uh, a lot to talk about. Uh, you will see me. I will see you. You can ask questions, comments, concerns, ideas. Uh, we always have fun. And I always, always uh, do a little TMI and tell you things I shouldn't. And then Jen gets bad at me. So if you're not a Status Coup member, become one right now to join the monthly video call. StatusCoup.com slash join. Once you become a member, you will get an invite to that video call. Again, starts at 730 Eastern this evening. And uh, patrons also are invited, all levels. Usually we do it for uh, $10 and higher levels, but we're having everybody join uh, just so everybody can kind of get a feel for what it is. And if you want uh, to, do, to join us every month, you could upgrade to the $10 a month level. Follow us at Status Coup. We released this story uh, that we're going to talk to you about today on Status Coup's Twitter. So you got to go follow us at Status Coup to see it. I'm at Jordan Chariton. Subscribe to our podcast. That's bit.ly slash status coup podcast. And join our email list, statuscoup.com. You will see the a box, a little box to enter your email. So uh, yesterday I, I didn't go, oh, I forgot to tell you, big news. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell this later too. Out of live stream jail in three days. For those of you new to Status Quo, we have been banned from live streaming for 90 days. And according to the calendar, we should be able to live stream again this coming Saturday. So this coming Sunday, we will return to our marathon live chat, live streaming, GoFundMe Sundays. Uh, we'll start at noon Eastern. We're going to have a special guest, which I'll tell you about later in this program. 
and uh, we are excited to be live again to talk to you. And uh, for today and, and for every day, this is a super chat. So if you're feeling super, particularly when you see all the work that went into this report we're about to uh, share with you, definitely leave a little contribution in the super chat. That's another way we grow. Uh, let me just email Colin back wherever you can fit it. It makes sense. So the Huffington Post recently had a story uh, about a new DNC finance chair. And this finance chair uh, it was appointed because the other one stepped down. The finance chair is basically number two to the chairman, which is Tom Perez. We know what you think about Tom Perez. Uh, not exactly a capital P progressive, but he does, of course, lead with his values. So uh, Chris Corgi was appointed to be the finance chair. And the Huffington Post story was pretty good. Uh, I did a video on it last week, and their story uh, showed that Mr. Corgi had donated to Kamala Harris uh, in January. It showed that Mr. Corgi had previously tweeted pretty anti-Bernie Sanders <laughs> sentiments uh, in, 28, in 2018, so not so recent, not so long ago, in December of 2018, uh, he retweeted a tweet that called Bernie Sanders a danger to the future of the Democratic Party. In 2016, during the hotly contested Democratic primary between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, he um, tweeted, the only burn you're going to feel, is the only burn that will be felt is the pain the middle class will feel from Bernie Sanders' tax increases. He is a real estate bigwig in South Florida. He's a lawyer, he's a former lobbyist, and he is one of the biggest fundraisers and money men in America. He has raised millions, with an M, millions, for the Democratic Party, and I'm about to share with you, he is also, wait for it, a mega donor to Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the previous DNC chairwoman, remember her? Miss Neutral, big donor to Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and a huge donor and fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. She also has given to Joe Biden in the past. Hmm. So, again, he is the finance chair. As finance chair, he, he said, I am... Uh, I am definitely going to uh, subscribe to the DNC's neutrality policy. And again, why this is so important is obviously one of the biggest issues with the 26th primary and, ca and campaign was it was basically the DNC tossing its full body onto the scale to make Hillary Clinton the nominee and sabotage Bernie Sanders' campaign. So it's very important who are they putting into positions now? What is their history? Who have they given money to? Have they publicly came out for or against candidates that are currently running? Well, as you're going to see in this story, he gave money to Kamala Harris in January of this year, and he gave money to Joe Biden while he was a senator, and he did not respond to our request for comment, nor did the DNC, as to whether he gave Joe Biden money right after Joe Biden's campaign launch, because there was about a week or two between Joe Biden announcing his campaign at the end of April and this guy, Chris Corgi, being named finance chair of the DNC. I have no way of knowing if he gave money because Joe Biden's financial information is not public yet. Joe Biden uh, announced his candidacy after uh, the deadline for the first uh, quarter, uh, where the Federal Election Commission posts donor information. So we don't know yet. Who's, we know companies who is giving Biden money because we know who he's doing fundraisers with, but I can't tell you whether this guy gave money to uh, Joe Biden since his campaign announcement, which would be pretty important to know if the new DNC finance chair has given money in the last three months to Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. Excuse me, the last five months to Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. So I'm going to read you the story again. Jen helped me out with this. And uh, it's at statuscoup.com, so go check it out. You can also check out on statuscoup.com our store, which I'll tell you about more. But we now have a merchandise store right there at the top. So if you want for the summer to get your status coup shirts, uh, get your status coup pillows, maybe we'll be able to come up with some beach towels. Who knows? Uh, I'll, I'll show you the store again later. So 
Headline, DNC pledges neutrality after hiring Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Hillary Clinton Megadona as finance chair. And right there in the, in the sub headline, apparently nothing has changed. DNC executive committee member James Zogby told status coup. So I'll read a little bit, stop, give you my thoughts. DNC chair, and again, we published this this, uh, this morning. Uh, this is Jen and I's reporting. DNC chair Tom Perez has vowed neutrality during the 2020 Democratic primary, three years after the party, by all objective measures, tossed its full body on the scale to make Hillary Clinton the Democratic nominee over Bernie Sanders. But Perez's mission may be complicated by the man he's appointed as the DNC's new finance chair. Chris Corgi, a Florida real estate mogul, attorney, former lobbyist, and prolific money man, who the New York Times once advised presidential candidates to make their first stop before deciding whether to run. Corgi's son seems to agree, dubbing his dad K-Money and K-Stacks. So let's stop for a moment. And I linked in the story to the New York Times piece. The New York Times once wrote, before launching a campaign, before hiring staffers, before doing anything. If a candidate is interested in running for president, the first thing they need to do is go kiss the ring of Chris Corgi, the new DNC finance chair. Uh, we'll put the link in the super chat to that New York Times story. His son calls him K-Money and K-Stacks. And I didn't report it in this story because it was about the father, Chris Corgi, but apparently his son has had some corruption and potential bribery scandals uh, in his uh, political life in South Florida. So, one lawmaker who has benefited from Corgi's cash is controversial former Democratic National Committee Chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, as well as former Secretary of State and 2016 Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton, who Corgi once referred to as a big sister to him. Seeing a trend here? Debbie Wasserman Schultz, chairwoman of the DNC in 2016 during the primary. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, shown in emails that WikiLeaks released, basically overseeing a public relations enterprise for Hillary Clinton while going on national television calling it neutral. Hillary Clinton, considered a big sister to this donor who raised millions for the Clintons over the years for both of their campaigns. Corgi donated, here we go, Corgi donated $2,700 to Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz in her 2018 re-election campaign, so last year, but maybe more importantly, he donated the same amount during her 2016 primary contest against surprise progressive insurgent and Sanders-endorsed Florida professor Tim Canova. At the time, Wasserman Schultz was, for the first time, vulnerable of losing her seat in the face of Canova, who received $3.8 million in small-dollar donations from 209,000 individual donors to compete with Wasserman Schultz's big money machine. Canova ultimately lost by 6,775 votes, but not without controversy. Broward County Supervisor of Elections Brenda Snipes, a Washerman Schultz ally, destroyed the paper ballots from that race, which cost her her job and resulted in a judge ruling that the destruction of the ballots for which Canova wanted to inspect seeking irregularities was illegal. Overall, Corgi donated $13,400 to Wasserman Schultz's campaign since 2011. He also gave the DNC a significant amount a year before Wasserman Schultz was named chairwoman. This is important. He donated $15,000 to the Democratic National Committee in April 2010. You with me? A year later, Wasserman Schultz was named chairwoman. A 15,000 donation is not a small amount to the Democratic National Committee. Most donations are smaller than that. He's given a lot, a lot of money to the Democratic National Committee in years before that. But in 2010, he gave $15,000. One year later, his candidate, his candidate and somebody that he has fundraised a lot of money for, as well as donated directly a lot of money to, becomes chairwoman. I, I, can't, I can't definitively say cause and effect, because I don't know. 
I don't know what happened in back rooms, but I can report fifteen thousand uh, dollars to the Democratic National Committee in 2010. Debbie Wasserman Schultz is made chairwoman in 2011. One of the big reasons she was made chairwoman in 2011 was because she had a she had a pretty pretty good uh, record of raising loads of cash from big donors like Chris Corgi. Again, major real estate figure in South Florida. So 15 grand, 2010 to the DNC. Uh, Wasserman Schultz becomes chairwoman right after that. So combing through financial records, status quo found that Corgi donated 5000 to Wasserman Schultz, to the, D, to the DNC, excuse me, in Wasserman Schultz's first month as chairwoman in 2011. Overall, he sunk $60,718 into the DNC's coffers during Wasserman Schultz's reign from 2011 through her resignation on the eve of the DNC convention in July 2016. Now, $60,718, why, while wow, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is the chairwoman, 2011 to 2016. This after $15,000 the year before she became chairwoman. Seems to me, this is somebody who really supports Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who had to resign in disgrace to the DNC. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who, as we'll talk about later, went on national TV spreading lies about Bernie Sanders' campaign and his supporters. So this is a person with a not, re not, not long ago, recent history of significant financial support to Debbie Wasserman Schultz. His support for Wasserman Schultz dates back even before she was running for Congress. Do he donated $1,000 to her in December 2003 when she was a Florida state senator. So she was a Florida state senator and then she ran for Congress. Of course, Wasserman Schultz was forced to resign as DNC chairwoman after WikiLeaks emails revealed the DNC under Wasserman Schultz leadership had actively propped up Hillary Clinton's campaign while attempting to sabotage Bernie Sanders' candidacy. As DNC chairwoman, Wasserman Schultz appeared far from neutral during the primary. In one of the highest profile instances, she appeared on national television and accused, accused Sanders supporters of allegedly stoking violence and throwing chairs at the Nevada Democratic Convention, a narrative that was repeated across national media outlets, but was clearly false. false. And I link to what shows that it was false. So this part about him supporting Debbie Wasserman Schultz is important. The DNC will tell you, well, Debbie Wasserman Schultz isn't with the DNC anymore. Uh, she has nothing to do with it, and progressives and Bernie Sanders supporters should have no worry about Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Well, she's still a congresswoman. Uh, she represents the area this gentleman lives. This gentleman has donated 13400 directly to her and $60,000 dollars $60, uh, while she was DNC chair, he donated before she was uh, even a congresswoman. So we have a long history and a long record of a relationship here. And basically the DNC, by saying, no, they're neutral, is telling you, oh, forget all his donations, forget their relationship, forget that they come from the same area. De Debbie Wasserman Schultz has no influence. I'll leave that for you to decide. But... Hillary Clinton and his relationship is even worse as far as money. Corgi's support for Hillary and Bill Clinton has been even more pronounced. He has raised millions for both going back to the 1990s as one of their top bundlers. A bundler raises, uh, you know, a lot of money for candidates, contacting friends, business associates, all that to get them to donate. Since 2005, he's donated $21,700 directly to the Clinton's campaign committees. In 2016, Corgi gave $41,000 to two joint fundraising committees between the Clinton campaign and the DNC. $25,000 to the Hillary Action Fund and $16,000 to the Hillary Victory Fund, a controversial joint fundraising committee between the Clinton campaign, the DNC, and state Democratic parties that Politico reported was akin to to money laundering. So let's add this up, okay? We got 21,000 directly to Hillary Clinton's uh, campaigns um, since 2005. So that's her 2008 campaign and her 2016 campaign. He's raised millions for Clinton, uh, including he, he raised a lot of money for her in 2016. He was one of her hillblazers, I think they called them. 
uh, which is you become a hillblazer if you raise a lot of money for uh, Hillary Clinton during her campaign. He also gave $41,000. So now you're talking direct money, 41,000, 21,000, 41, 61, 60, almost $63,000 between directly to her campaign committee as well as the joint fundraising committees. And the reason Politico reported that it was a money laundering scheme, the Hillary uh, Victory Fund, is because it was supposed to be shared money. So money, money uh, sent to the DNC uh, was supposed to uh, go and or sent to the Hillary Clinton campaign. It was supposed to be spread where Hillary Clinton's campaign got some, the DNC got some, and it, the uh, state parties, state Democratic parties got some. However, it somehow got funneled, uh, most of it got funneled back to Hillary Clinton's campaign. So when Politico is saying it's a, uh, Politico, a corporate mouthpiece, is saying it's a money laundering scheme, it's a money laundering scheme, which I've reported on previously. He also donated between $100,000 and $250,000 to the Clinton Foundation, according to the Washington Post. Overall, Corgi has offered Hillary Clinton the most Florida sunshine, or as the Tampa Bay Times put it, no one is closer to the Clintons in Florida, and almost nobody in America has raised more money for Hillary Clinton. Nobody in America has raised more money than Hillary Clinton, for Hillary Clinton. In the political circle of life, Corgi's support for Wasserman Schultz makes sense. She's a powerful Florida congresswoman who's known to have a transactional relationship with big Democratic donors. I linked to an example of that transactional relationship. She's also been a longtime ally of Hillary Clinton, having served as Clinton's 2008 uh, co-chair on her presidential campaign. Wasserman Schultz's previous entrenchment in Clinton world would have endeared her to Corgi, who's described his relationship with the former Secretary of State as going beyond writing checks. You ready for this? She was almost like a big sister, really caring. She would offer advice. Corgi told the Miami Herald in 2016 about the support and advice Clinton offered while he was going through a divorce with his wife. Well, if you give me, if you help raise millions of dollars, I will sit on the phone uh, with you till two in the morning and give you the best breakup advice I could give. I mean, I'm not minimizing it. Divorce is a painful process and I guess good for Hillary to, to give him some nice advice. Uh, but Obviously, the, the initial relationship was based on him raising a hell of a lot of money uh, for the Clintons. Uh, and Corgi went to bat for his big sister in 2016 and has clearly held a grudge against Bernie Sanders. And this goes to the Huffington Post, who reported this before status quo. But as Huffington Post reported, in December 2018, Corgi retweeted a tweet from someone calling Bernie Sanders a dang dangerous to the future of the Democratic Party. This is six months ago, folks. Corgi retweeted, somebody writing, Bernie Sanders is a danger to the future of the Democratic Party. During the 2016 campaign, Corgi tweeted out, there is no choice. The only burn the middle class will feel from Bernie is the pain from all of the tax increases. Both of those tweets have mysteriously been deleted. In response to Corgi's previous financial and political support for Wasserman Schultz and Clinton, DNC Executive Committee member James Zogby who supports Bernie Sanders, expressed serious concern regarding Corgi's appointment as finance chair, telling status quo that apparently nothing has changed since 2016. Let that sink in. This is James Ogby. He's a DNC executive board member. He's a Bernie Sanders supporter. He chooses his words. He chooses his words carefully. Said, apparently nothing has changed since 2016's Democratic primary that, if you recall, former DNC chair Donna Brazil, who isn't, doesn't like me, publicly wrote that it wasn't a fair fight and then took it back really quickly. She was trying to sell books. Zogby, Zogby went on to say, Chairman Perez's appointment of Corgi continues a disturbing trend of the lack of accountability, transparency, and democracy coming from the DNC. Woo! James, tell him. Let him have it, James Zogby. And uh, this was over the phone we spoke yesterday. Tried to get Bernie Sanders' campaign to respond, but uh, no response. No response. 
He went on to say, appointments get uh, on Corgi's um, appointment. Appointments get made and we have no, no idea until they're done deals. It would have taken nothing, especially given what happened in the last election. It would have taken nothing for Perez to have given us advance notice and even talk to the Bernie people on the DNC. But to come out with this and then after a couple of articles say, oh, no, 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 he's pledged neutrality is nonsense. It's a backhanded way of dealing with a problem that needs to be addressed straight out front. And that is, is the party going to put its thumb on the scale? Is the party going to be accountable or are we going to have to wait for the next Donna Brazil book to get written before we know what's going on? And the answer is, apparently nothing has changed. And that's troubling. He's basically saying, are, are they rigging it right out in the open? But obviously they aren't doing it in the open. In this case, I think, I mean, if they're trying to show neutrality, they must know that hiring this man does not show neutrality, right? So he's basically saying, uh, are we going to find out which way they rigged it, you know, after the 2020 primary and the next Donna Brazil book? Zogby concluded that Corgi's appointment creates a situation where you have to be a naysayer, ultimately making this an unacceptable way to run a political party. Corgi has also, don also bundled at least 500000 for President Obama, according to the Miami New Times. In, 2002, in 2012, he hosted a fundraiser for Obama at his seven-bedroom, eight-bathroom home in Pinecrest, Florida. Wasserman Schultz was in attendance for that. He's also raised $7 million for former Vice President Al Gore and former Secretary of State John Kerry. Corgi's financial support for Wall Street and business-friendly candidates continued as recently as months ago. In January, he donated the maximum allowed of $2,700 to California Senator Kamala Harris's presidential campaign, whom Bloomberg reported recently held a fundraiser at Citigroup Managing Director Jan Kotenlem's Fifth Avenue apartment in New York City. How's that for being for the people? For the people in Citigroup's penthouse on Fifth Avenue. Kamala Harris, for the people. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. The arrogance, the arrogance of this candidate, Kamala Harris, the arrogance of the DNC to sit here and say, we're for the people. Trump, 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 we're for the people. We're going to give relief to the middle class. Have we heard this before? What do you think? She's having fundraisers at the top of Citigroup's uh, managing, who is it? The managing director of Citigroup at the top of his Fifth Avenue apartment, and they're discussing, you know, um, free college, Medicare for all, universal basic income for the masses, strengthening labor unions, more productive and, str and stronger regulations on Citigroup, uh, banks stop ending their uh, investments in fracking and big, big pipelines that are destroying the planet and are contaminating our water. I'm sure all of these things uh, were discussed between caviar and champagne. champagne. So Corgi gave 2700 to Kamala Harris in January, but that came with a little caveat. If former Virginia, he told Kamala Harris, if former governor, Virginia governor Terry McAuliffe who has been infamously tied to Bill and Hillary Clinton financially and politically for three decades, jumped into the fray, Corgi's money would go to him. Quote, I did give a contribution to Kamala Harris, but when I gave it to her, I told her, if McAuliffe jumps in, I'm supporting him, he told CNN in March. I have made it clear to her, as well as everyone, every other person who has approached me, including five or six of them running, that if McAuliffe runs, I am supporting him. McAuliffe ultimately decided not to run, but apparently the, admi the admiration seems mutual because McAuliffe told The Hill, Democrats on all levels across the country will benefit from his leadership. Talking about Corgi's appointment to the DNC finance chair position. I don't know. And I don't know, Corgi. I mean, I've spoken with some people from South Florida who do. Uh, they don't really have wonderful things to say about him, but I didn't put it in the story because I don't, you know. It's neither here or there what kind of person he is. Uh, but what I will tell you, what I will tell you, you're starting to see a trend. This new DNC finance chair, 
who has openly called Bernie Sanders a danger to the future of the Democratic Party, supports Wall Street friendly, actually Wall Street loving candidates like Hillary Clinton, like Terry McAuliffe, like Kamala Harris. He has donated before to uh, Democratic Senate senators like Chuck Schumer. Uh, he has given money to Joe Biden when Joe Biden was a senator. He supports candidates that are business friendly, that help real estate executives land big contracts and development deals. I believe the Clint I believe Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. There was a bit of questioning that went on about her directing uh, contracts to one of his companies. So what you have here, what you have here is somebody who clearly, clearly in a leadership position, his inherent interest and bias is for candidates like Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, pro-business, faux-progressive candidates. And he is going to be the, he is the finance chair. It's up for uh, approval at the August DNC member. So as finance chair, you, have, you play a huge role in bringing money into the DNC. You play a role in what joint fundraising agreements the DNC would make. Remember, I, I spoke about it earlier in this story, the fundraising agreement that was made between the Hillary Clinton campaign, the DNC, and the Democratic state parties, which they said, oh, we offered it to Bernie Sanders too. Well, Bernie Sanders isn't doing corrupt fundraising <laughs> deals, so which Politico called a money laundering scheme. Well, this gentleman is the one who would be in charge of those fundraising agreements. He's also the deputy to Tom Perez. So one would think he'll be in the room helping making decisions uh, for with the DNC in terms of this primary. When they're rigging it, folks, oftentimes it's when it's being done in real time, you don't see it. You don't see it. So, you you know, it's up to you to think, does, does this guy appointing a Debbie Wasserman Schultz mega donor, a Hillary Clinton mega donor, somebody who calls Hillary Clinton his big sister, somebody who has given money to Kamala Harris, somebody who gave over $4,000 to Joe Biden when he was a senator, Somebody that would not respond to me, nor would the DNC respond to me, if he gave Joe Biden money after he launched his campaign. Again, there was a week to two weeks between Joe Biden announcing his campaign and this man becoming DNC finance chair. There's no way for me to know if he gave money to uh, Joe Biden's campaign because it's not with the, the his donors aren't with the FEC yet, F Federal Election Commission yet. So we don't know. We don't know. But if he didn't, one would think he'd answer, or the DNC would say, oh, he says no. If it's not answering, I'm going to assume he did give money to Joe Biden, which I'd be happy to correct if they do answer me, which would mean he gave money to Kamala Harris five months ago in January, and he's given money to Joe Biden basically a month ago. And now he's the DNC finance chair. Oh, yeah, he said Bernie Sanders is a danger to the future of the Democratic Party. Neutral. Neutral party. Oh, while donating to Harris's 2020 campaign, Corgi has also given the Democratic presidential candidate and former Vice President Joe Biden uh, during his time in the Senate, donating 4000 in the two in the decade of the 2000s. Again, it's unknown whether Corgi has donated since Biden announced his 2020 campaign, since Biden's donor information hasn't been submitted yet to the Federal Election Commission. Neither the DNC or Corgi uh, responded to status quo's request for comment regarding whether he has donated or raised money for Biden since announcing his candidacy. Despite his history and a clear disdain for Sanders, Corgi vowed to abide by the DNC's neutrality policy. Quote, I have worked tirelessly to help the Democratic Party and have been proud to support a wide array of Democratic candidates, Corgi said in a statement, according to the Huffington Post. I'm fully committed to the DNC's neutrality policy, and I look forward to raising the funds necessary to help whoever our nominee is. The DNC gave me the same exact statements. Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign did not respond to status coup request for comment on this story. You know, it's not a shocker. I mean, telling you about giving you a behind the scenes, it's been hard for me to get responses from Bernie Sanders' uh, campaign for stories I'm working on. 
that might not be anything about me or status quo. Uh, I, uh, you know, campaigns are busy, and there's a lot of reporters reaching out that they get back to some and don't get back to others. It just depends uh, what their strategy is and strategy. There's long-term strategy, and then there's your strategy as you go in a campaign. So your long-term strategies uh, could be different than your strategies this week. So this week, they might not want to focus on a potential DNC scandal because they're focusing on Bernie's, uh, Bernie might be showing up to the shareholders meeting at Walmart, which is a great thing, and other policies he's been, he's been rolling out. So they might not want to get in the mud with the DNC. Personally, I think it's a huge mistake because I, I don't think at this point, Bernie Sanders' campaign is naive. Uh, Jeff Weaver told the Huffington Post, uh, this is very concerning. Uh, it, I didn't speak to him for this story. I don't think James Ogby, who is a DNC member, a Bernie Sanders surrogate, uh, would be saying absolutely nothing has changed since 2016 and it's complete nonsense uh, when the DNC says, the, you know, this guy's going to be neutral and they're neutral. I don't think he'd be saying that if it wasn't known. There's a lot of angry people right now and a lot of ticked off people in the Bernie Sanders camp in regards to this appointment. Specifically, the heavy-handed and the backhanded, according to James Ogby, way, Tom Perez didn't even bring uh, his choice or, or the notion to nominate him for finance chair and run it by the Bernie Sanders people, even out of courtesy. I mean, he's the chairman, so it's his decision, but don't you think if you're trying to genuinely mend fences, if you're trying to genuinely be neutral in the primary process, don't you think you would want to mention that Debbie Wasserman Schultz mega donor and Hillary Clinton mega donor and somebody who gave Kamala Harris money and Joe Biden money. Don't you think you might want to let Bernie Sanders campaign know you're thinking of putting him in place and the reason? And maybe this gentleman should have reached out to the Bernie Sanders campaign and say, hey, you know, I said what I said in the past. Uh, that was my own uh, political beliefs, but you know, I'm not here uh, to elect a candidate. I'm here to make sure a Democrat wins. Don't you think that would have been the smart move for him to approach the Sanders campaign? As far as we know, that, that did not occur. So that's our report for today. Uh, uh, Jen, help me out with that. This is the kind of reporting we can do and we want to do for you. Uh, it takes a lot of time to go through uh, FEC documents to confirm the numbers and all that, but we thought it was important because honestly, what was the biggest story of the 2016 campaign other than Bernie Sanders' surprise out of nowhere movement? It was what the DNC did. So status quo is going to be on the forefront reporting and exposing funny business, shady business that the DNC is doing. And when the Democratic National Committee gives us a rubber a, a bumper sticker or a, or a rubber stamp statement that they already gave the Huffington Post, when the Democratic National Committee does not answer whether this man has given money to Joe Biden, when this man, who I reached out to, Chris Corgi, would not answer if he's given money to Joe Biden, that's concerning. We need to know if the new DNC finance chair, who is one of the highest positions within the DNC, has donated to both Kamala Harris and Joe Biden within the last five months. Because right before he donated to Kamala Harris in January of this year, in December 2018, he was retweeting people saying Bernie Sanders is a danger to the future of the Democratic Party. And by the way, it's not only exclusive to Bernie Sanders. If this guy wants to win, if this guy basically wants to prop up and tilt the playing field towards a Joe Biden or Kamala Harris, well, not that I want these other candidates to win, but, you know, that's not exactly fair to a Pete Buttigieg or a, um, well, he probably wouldn't mind Buttigieg either, but a Cory Booker. Oh, wait, he would, probably wouldn't mind Cory Booker either. I'm trying to think of, oh, Tulsi Gabbard, that's not fair to. Elizabeth Warren, that's not fair to. Um, Mike Gravel, who's still trying to get on that debate stage, who I interviewed last week. The interview's up. Go watch it. It was amazing and a really funny moment when his phone went off and I thought it was like an a airplane uh, <laughs> falling. Um, that's not fair to any candidate that is progressive having this gentleman in power. And by the way, I don't have evidence that they're actively doing something untoward right now. Like, I don't have evidence because, you know, I can't, I'm not going to hack their emails. I don't know what emails are flying around. I don't know what they're saying about Bernie Sanders or Tulsi Gabbard. I don't know if they are planting stories like they did in 2016 
against Bernie Sanders or Tulsi Gabbard or Elizabeth Warren. But what I do know, this guy, his son calls him K-Stacks and K-Money. This guy is a big financial sugar daddy. I don't mean in a, in a sexual way. I mean, he is the go-to for Democratic presidential candidates. Hillary Clinton wasn't gabbing on the phone with him, giving him advice about his divorce, you know, out of kindness. It's the money, Lebowski. It's the money, Lebowski. And if you have not pressed the like button on this non-live stream, what are you doing? If you appreciate this reporting and you have not pressed the like button, what are you doing? If you feel super after, feel, after reading this report, if you feel enraged after reading this report, let us know in the super chat. And reminder, folks, if you're coming to this late, tonight is our members call, our monthly members call for patrons and members. All levels are invited tonight. So if you, if you become a member before the call at 7.30 Eastern time, you will get an invite link to join Jen and I. It's a video call, so you'll see my ugly face. I'll see your not ugly faces, and we'll talk. We'll chat, we'll laugh, we'll cry. You'll ask me questions, comments, concerns, ideas. Uh, Jen always tells me I am TMI, so we're going to, and we'll definitely talk about this story tonight. Uh, so join us at 7.30 Eastern for our paying members. Again, you can become a status quo member for as low as $5 a month, for as low as $10 a month, for as low as $20 a month, or $179 annually. And this month, uh, till the end of the month, we're giving away Free status quo stickers for any member who signs up at the $5 level. And we're given status quo coffee mugs for any member that signs up at the annual $179 level. Uh, and, you know, coffee, tea, if you want to put other things in there, uh, whatever you want. But it's super, super important. Again, the way we're going to do this reporting, the way we are going to do this reporting is growing our membership. Because we are breaking these stories not on the road. Imagine what we could do covering the campaign on the road. From my experience in 2016 covering Bernie's campaign, Trump's campaign, to a lesser degree Hillary Clinton's campaign, in the field, how you break news is being in the field, being close to the action, developing the sources, and luckily, I don't give a damn about access to the candidates. I can care less. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to hold things back. If I find out untoward or corrupt things about anybody, you're going to hear about it from status quo because... You're not watching for access. Sure, it'd be great to get an interview with Bernie or Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or any of these people, but I'm not in this for access. And if you're watching us for access, there's other places you could do that. So uh, before we move on to the next topic, just going to give you a little uh, refresher from Ty on uh, why you should join Status Quo. Out front tonight, chaos at the White House. President Trump's deputy chief of staff, his communications director is just because of their connection to President Trump. And I know you've been saying you learned recently that Donald Trump threatened to sue his former schools. If they tired of hearing about Trump 24 seven. Become a member at status for only $10 a month. Click the notification with your help. We can start the media revolution. And uh, before Bernie went on stage, I spoke with his supporters online here, uh, and you really get that feeling from them. A lot of people I spoke with said, you know. This That's Ty, who has uh, got nine days, nine days left for him to shorten and kind of tweak our Flushing Flint documentary that we're going to submit it first to Michael Moore's film festival, and uh, then we're going to send it to a bunch of other film festivals, and we might have something in the works. Uh, otherwise for distrib distribution of that documentary. So that's why he's been MIA, but he's working and working hard for you. So remember, press the like button. If you have not pressed the like button, I don't know what you're doing. I am excited, excited to tell you. Uh, I wanna, wanted to make this announcement, but I was waiting for Colin to uh, help me out with it. Uh, the screen's about to go black, but for a good reason. Give me a minute. This Sunday, this Sunday, we are out of live stream jail. We will be live streaming live. This coming Sunday uh, at 12 Eastern time. So that would be noon Eastern time. And guess who is joining us? That would be one, the one, the only. Take a guess. Oh, no, that's not who I wanted. Hold on. Hold on. 
This is what happens when you do things live. Hold on. Oh, is that what I wanted? Here we go. Door. Yes. J. Uh, here we go. The legendary Jimmy Dore will join us Sunday. That's me breaking out of jail, and that's my microphone to Jimmy. So we'll have Jimmy on. There is a lot to discuss, a lot to discuss, from this story we just broke to, I mean, who knows? By Sunday, we might be at war with Iran. Uh, that obviously is not something Jimmy or I want, and there's plenty of other things. So check it out. This Sunday, noon Eastern, we start. Noon Eastern, and we will be fundraising like we used to do, but haven't done in a few weeks because we have been banned from live streaming, which I'll have comments on at the beginning of our live stream Sunday. So join us noon Eastern, tell your friends, tell your mailman, tell the animals, tell your boyfriend, tell your girlfriend, tell your wife, tell your husband, you're unavailable or they could join you. So thanks for Jimmy for joining us. I'm looking forward to speaking with him. And what we're trying to get some other people too. And email, email, if, oh, excuse me. You could do a GoFundMe contribution before Sunday because Sunday we're gonna be pushing our GoFundMe hard. Uh, you could do a GoFundMe contribution before Sunday, and if you do a GoFundMe contribution before Sunday, leave a comment, and I'll read it during Sunday's live stream. Your comment could be anything, ideas, questions, comments, whatever you want. Uh, we'll read it, any, comment, uh, any comments that come in with a donation before Sunday. So, another story I wanted to cover, and I'm a few days late on both of them, but I still think pretty relevant. So, did you see this Daily Beast story? on Tulsi Gabbard, I, I, I couldn't tell if, if this was like a public relations thing or it was from the Daily Beast or, or like a super PAC ad. Did you see this? Tulsi Gabbard is campaign is being boosted by Putin apologists. Like did, did Keith Oberman or Rachel Maddow like hack into the, D the DNC, the Daily Beast system and take over? I'm not even gonna read the whole thing. This is from Lachlan Markey and Sam Stein. Hawaii Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard's campaign for the Democratic presidential nomination is being underwritten by some of the nation's leading Russia files. Some of the nation's leading Russia files. Donors to her campaign in the first quarter of this year include Stephen F. Cohen, a Russian studies professor at New York University and a Kremlin, <laughs> a prominent Kremlin sympathizer, Sharon Tennyson, a vocal Putin supporter who nonetheless found herself detained by Russian authorities in 2016, and an employee of the Kremlin-backed broadcaster RT, who appears to have donated under the alias Goofy Grapes. First of all, Stephen, uh, Stephen Cohen, uh, he's a Russian scholar. He's one of the most foremost experts on Russia in the United States. He has written for The Nation and other places. He's not some Joe Schmo Kremlin sympathizer. He's somebody that, unlike the Daily Beast, unlike a lot of the people at MSNBC, unlike the Washington Post, actually understands how Russian politics works, actually understands a lot about Putin because there has been a lot of propaganda in America about Russia. I don't think Putin's a great guy. I, I think he is pretty brutal, but so is most of the leaders we're against. Excuse me, m most of the leaders we support around the world. Uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, ring a bell, from Saudi Arabia. We were friends with Saddam Hussein before we were enemies. How about brutal dictators in Iran we've supported? after overthrowing democratically elected ones. Um, you know, supporting, supporting the Contras and that brutal, those brutal death squads to butcher the Nicaraguan people, ring a bell? So we're down with, you know, brutal, brutal, uh, shall we say, American puppets, if they'll give us their oil, their gold, minerals, and so on and so on. If they won't, well, it's enemy of the state, terrible person, brutal dictator, humanitarian crisis under them. The ones that do give us their stuff, 
well, you know, it's, it's in our geopolitical strategic incident, uh, interest to be tight with Saudi Arabia while they butcher Yemen. You noticing a trend here? But I couldn't believe, I mean, obviously the Daily Beast is, is as establishment as they get, but I couldn't believe this. And they're writing it like this is some profound trend. It's three people that have donated. She's gotten 75,000 individual donors. She will be on that debate stage. So they found three people, an RT employee, and by the way, sorry to tell Daily Beast and others, RT America, aside from status coup, and yes, I will take, say status coup is the preeminent reporting voice on Flint. RT America has done a lot of good stuff on the Flint water crisis while the rest of the media does nothing. RT America has done a lot of good stuff on stories like Standing Rock and water contamination and local corruption. So if that makes me a crumbling puppet or stooge, then so be it. You got to call out good journalism where it is. And it's not coming from CNN or the Daily Beast. I mean, the Daily Beast, I've sent them story after story. You cannot get the Daily Beast to cover something if it's not Trump related or Russia related. That's it. It's all about clicks and all about sensationalism. Period. End of story. And remember to press the like button if you have not yet. So, uh, donors, uh, excuse me, Gabbard is one of her party's more Russia-friendly voices in an era of deep democratic suspicion of the country over its effort to tip the 20, 2016 election in favor of President Donald Trump. I love how they write, in an era of deep democratic suspicion, like this is suddenly a new thing. The United States propaganda against the Soviet Union and then Russia has been going on since the 1940s. But we're suddenly in a new era of this? And tipping the election? Come on, give me a break. Have these people read the exit polls in Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Pennsylvania? It's like they act like, uh, you know, Putin was standing with a crowbar in the voting booths with these people. Her financial support from prominent pro-Russian voices in the U.S. is a small portion of the total she raised, but it still il illustrates the degree to which she deviates from her party's mainstream on such a contentious and high-profile issue. Well, actually, no. See, the Daily Beast is trying to paint it as they like her because she's pro-Russian. No, they like her because she's anti-Cold War with Russia. She's anti-nuclear war with Russia. Does that make sense? Or are we all puppets who are anti-war? I know YouTube thinks we're puppets because if you do anything anti-war, promise you this video will be suppressed and probably demonetized because I'm talking about Tulsi Gabbard and I'm talking about not wanting to go war with YouTube. It extends everywhere. Corporate media, social media, they get rid of anti-war voices. They get rid of people who, you know, aren't foaming at the mouth about Russia, aren't foaming at the mouth. Yeah, Juan Guaido in Venezuela, let's elect the Democratic leader, Juan Guaido. No, let's not. He's not the Democratic leader. And we'll have more on Venezuela tomorrow. But it, it, it's really unbelievable. It's really unbelievable to me that the Daily Beast would write this. And for what real reason? That's, that's what also doesn't make sense, because obviously they have an agenda writing this. Obviously, they were looking through her donors to find out. It's not like this was fell in their lap. You have to look through the donor information. Well, why exactly? Because, you know, in fairness, I like Tulsi Gabbard. We've interviewed her. She's not doing swell in the polls. A big reason of that is because of stories like this, because CNN has smeared her, MSNBC has smeared her, The View has smeared her, she's a Putin apologist, this and that. So they basically have done the Bernie blackout to her, but after smearing her, then it was a blackout. So it's not, do they see her as a threat based on seeing a lot of support for her on Twitter and Facebook? And she has the support of a lot of independent media watchers. Like you gotta find someone a little bit of a threat or try to smear them even more before she goes on the democratic debate stage so that it minimizes potentially her getting some momentum. That's the only reason I could think for doing this. I mean, I don't agree with every single thing in Tulsi Gabbard's record, but I do agree. Other than Bernie Sanders, I like her the best out of any candidate. Uh, I think she's more to the left than Bernie Sanders on foreign policy. I like the fact I'm not a, I'm not a war hawk, uh, but I do respect somebody who's actually served in these pointless wars because maybe we should listen to them and get their insight, their perspective. Maybe they'd have a little bit more reasoned thought. 
on whether we should go to war or topple other governments based on seeing up close what the a actual effects of that are on American soldiers, on uh, Muslim people around the world, on the families of American soldiers that suffer the consequences after. But the Daily Beast, art, the, the article was missing any context in that. So what's interesting, data on Gabbard's financial supporters only covers the first three months of the year. In that time, her campaign received just over $1,000 from Cohen, arguably the, leadings, the nation's leading intellectual apologist for Russian President Vladimir Putin. I love how he, she got $1,000 from this guy, $1,000 from a Russian scholar. To them, a, a Putin uh, apologist or whatever. But Hawaiian Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard's campaign for the Democratic presidential nomination is being underwritten by some of the nation's leading Russophiles. So underwritten would give off the impression that most of her campaign money is coming from pro-Russia or sympathetic to, to Russia um, donors. So you think Tulsi Gabbard is traveling from New Hampshire to Iowa to South Carolina, back to New Hampshire, back to Iowa, and round and round she goes on Stephen Cohen's $1,000 donation or whatever the amount is that she got from an RT employee. She got 1000 from Goofy Grapes, who apparently, I think, works for comedian... Um, Oh, as an employee, oh, who listed his or her occupation as comedian and employer as red, uh, redacted tonight as current events comedy show on Russian state-backed broadcaster RT. So basically it seems that, that person works on Lee Camp's show, Redacted Tonight. Oh my Lord, somebody from Redacted Tonight is donating $1,000 to Tulsi Gabbard? Oh my God, Lee Camp, that Kremlin apologist on on. RT, who, you know, exposes the surveillance state, exposes, you know, the awful, awful uh, things going on with oil pipelines and fossil fuel companies destroying the country and big agri ag agricultural uh, companies destroying the country and was on the forefront in 2016, exposing the DNC rigging uh, the primary. Oh, what a Kremlin apologist. That psh, game over. Somebody from RT work, working for a comedian gave to uh, Tulsi Gabbard. She's clearly out of control, this Tulsi Gabbard. We can't have it. I'm not going to read you anymore because it's absurd. But the point is, it's not a coincidence you're seeing hit pieces on Bernie Sanders and you're seeing hit pieces on Tulsi Gabbard. They're obviously trying to eliminate these people now so they could prop up Joe Biden, so they could prop up Kamala Harris, Maybe Beto O'Rourke gets a second act. You know, he did his little town hall with CNN last night where he did his best Hillary Clinton impersonation. You know, Hillary Clinton said in 2016, I was there at that event. Uh, Medicare for all will never, ever come to pass. We don't have the time to try for some theoretical debate on something that will never, ever come to pass. Well, Beto O'Rourke last night said, you know, I don't think the people who need health care have time uh, to find something perfect. Way to inspire, Beto. Inspire your corporate donors, but not progressive voters. Not even progressive voters, just voters. Polls say a majority of Republicans are support Medicare for all. So the Tulsi hit came and also the Bernie hit. So I reported to you last week that the New York Times did a pretty shameful piece uh, where they tried to link Bernie Sanders uh, to basically being like a, a, a Soviet sympathizer. It was basically in the headline. So Bernie Sanders' campaign was rightfully ticked off. So Bernie requested an interview. And I'm not going to read the whole interview, but he wanted to get an interview because they smeared him. I mean, the headline was basically saying Bernie Sanders brings like Soviet style politics back, back to Burlington. So this headline of the interview was equally as much an attempt to paint Bernie as somewhat like not American, against America. Do you get that? I did my best to stop American foreign policy. That's the headline. Hmm. 
In an interview, one of the leading candidates for the 2020 Democratic presidential nomination discusses his long-held opposition to war and his support for socialist leaders. Ooh. So Sanders said, he started out by saying, let me just say this. I plead guilty to throughout my adult life doing everything that I can to prevent war and destruction. As a young person, long before I ever held any position, I was active in opposition to the war in Vietnam. As a mayor, I did my best to stop American foreign policy, which for years was overthrowing governments in Latin America and installing puppet regimes. I did everything that I could as mayor of a small city to stop the United States from getting involved in another war in Central America, trying to overthrow a government. I am very proud that in my small city, we established two sister programs, which I believe honestly are still going on today. One with Yaroslavl, a city in Russia, uh, the other with a city, Puerto Cabezas, in Nicaragua. And I happen to believe that cultural exchanges and student exchanges are a very important tool to try to bring people together and avoid wars. While we're at it, I also helped to lead the opposition to the war in Iraq. I voted against the first war, and I voted against the second war. I've done everything I can to try to get the United States out of Yemen in a war that is causing unbelievable destruction in that country. And I will do everything I can to see us not getting involved in a war with Iran. That is my view, and I make no apologies for it. So that's a pretty thorough statement. Uh, you could tell where he stands, whether you're for him or against him. He's anti-war. And that's what he's running on. Think, guess what the New York Times' first question was? In the top of our story, we talk about the rally you attended in Managua, Managua and a wire report at the time said there was anti-American chants from the crowd. Bernie answers, the United States at that time, I don't know how much you know about this, was actively supporting the contrast to overthrow the Nicaraguan government. So, so that there's anti-American sentiment? I remember that. I remember that event very clearly. So you do recall hearing those chants, dun, dun, dun. I think the Wire report has them saying, here, there, everywhere, the Yankees will die. Bernie Sanders says, they were fighting against America, uh-huh. Yes, what is your point? I wanted to, the New York Times reporter interjected, are you shocked to learn that there was anti-American sentiment in Nicaragua? <laughs> Bernie says, the reporter says, my point was, I wanted to know if you had heard that. I don't remember, no. Of course there was an anti-American sentiment there. This was a war being funded by the U.S. against the people of Nicaragua. People were being killed in that war. She, she won't let it go. Do you think if you had heard that directly, you would have stayed at the rally? Are you interested in speaking with Bernie Sanders about his foreign policy views, what he would do as president while we're bombing nine countries currently, while we're helping to aid Saudi Arabia, demolish and commit genocide in Yemen, while Trump is literally with John Bolton's mustache at his helm, leading us to war with Iran? We're still in Afghanistan. We have uh, residual forces in Iraq that nobody knows about. Trump has doubled and tripled Obama's drone war. Are you interested in talking about that? Or are you interested in basically painting Bernie Sanders into a corner as not leaving a rally that had anti-American chants? How dare you, Bernie Sanders, go to a rally in Nicaragua that was being de demolished and people were being slaughtered by death squads funded by the United States, the Contras. How dare you not turn around and poke your thumb in them for saying anything about super duper fuck yeah America. Excuse me, I just demonetized this video again. I can't win. I'll never learn. Swear jar. Super chat swear jar, please. Let it go. Let's go. So, I think, I think, Sydney, with all due respect, you don't understand a word that I'm saying. She continues, do you believe you had an accurate view of President Ortega at the time? I'm wondering if you're, Bernie says, this was not about Ortega. Do you understand? I don't know if you do or not. Do you know that the United States overthrew the government of Chile way back? Do you happen to know that? Do you? I'm asking you a simple question. What point do you want to make? The Times reporter said. Bernie says, my point is that fascism developed in Chile as a result of that. The United States overthrew the government of Guatemala, a democratically elected government, overthrew the governor of Brazil. I strongly oppose U.S. policy, which overthrows governments, especially democratically elected governments around the world. So this issue is not so much Nicaragua or the government of Nicaragua. The issue was, 
Should the United States continue a policy of overthrowing governments in Latin America and Central America? I believe then that it was wrong, and I believe today it's wrong. That's why I do not believe the United States should overthrow the government of Venezuela. I'm wondering if now you view Ortega and the government diff differently knowing what you do now. Well, this is now 30 years later. Something like that, the reporter said. I'm very concerned about the anti-democratic policies of the Ortega government. Yes, the Times reporter. Is there anything you believe about Latin America, believed about Latin America or the Soviet Union in the 1980s that you no longer believe today? No, the Soviet Union was author an authoritarian dictatorship and that's what I believe then and that's what I believe the case to be today. That's why they were there. That's what they were. On the other hand, I was going to do everything that I could to prevent a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. I'm not going to read anymore because the point is they're clearly not interested in giving Bernie Sanders a fair interview to actually have him explain his policies and his foreign policy, which frankly he was lacking, which he admits he was lacking expertise and really interest in foreign policy in the 2016 campaign. But they don't they don't care. They don't want to hear him. Uh, or give him a platform to share his foreign policy views, which, frankly, are pretty popular. He wants, again, I think Tulsi Gabbard is a little stronger on it, but Bernie Sanders has spoken out about us going uh, to regime change with Venezuela and us going to war with Iran. And he has spoken out against, uh, you know, war first, and he's spoken up for uh, diplomacy and cooperation between countries. And he's not somebody who's going to make uh, military uh, arrangements and, and policy based on whether we're getting oil, oil. So between the Daily Beast attacking Bernie Sanders, the New York Times, this is the second piece in 48 hours, uh, not so subtly trying to paint him as a Soviet sympathizing pro-communist boogeyman. And the reason they're doing that is the New York Times knows its demographic. It's an older reader. Yeah, they have some younger view readers, but most of the New York Times are establishment, uh, capital E establishment, sipping their tea and coffee in the New York area, D.C., internationally. They're not the Bernie Sanders base. So basically, the New York Times is playing to its audience pre-existing uh, uh, biases that are formed by reporting like this. It's a shame, too. And by the way, you know, people were criticizing Bernie, like you're acting like Trump attacking a reporter. He's not attacking the free press, but I would, if as a reporter, if I ask questions like that, I would expect to be attacked because I clearly, it, they're not, first of all, she's factually wrong in a lot of things. She's lacking. She doesn't offer the context and C, she's clearly coming in with a bias. You know, if I'm interviewing someone that I know I'm going to be hard on, I actually don't write first question, like go for the throat. That's not the way you do it. You throw out, you know, a couple uh, question or two, warm it up a little bit because um, they're taking the time and they're agreeing to interview you with. So even if you know uh, there's some things that you're going to have to challenge them on, even if you know, uh, you know, you personally don't support them, you still show them respect in the beginning of the interview. And when you challenge them, you have to do it respectfully. You know, I don't, just because I disagree with Kamala Harris or Joe Biden, it's not like I'm going to clobber them over the head if I get an interview. It's not the way to do it, and you're not going to have any credibility as a journalist if you do it like that. But right out of the gate, Bernie Sanders makes this pretty in-depth, I think, serious statement about his views. And she says, well, what about hearing this chant at a rally? The paper of record, right? So as we end today, I want to give you a, a, a reminder we're at a live stream jail this Sunday, noon Eastern. Start the GoFundMe contributions now because it's our GoFundMe Sunday marathon. We're also trying to grow membership Sunday. Uh, so you could contribute to GoFundMe. We'll put the link right there in the super chat. Jimmy will be on with us. Uh, we, uh, we've missed uh, Jimmy, so happy to have him uh, for our triumphant live stream return. We've been banned for 90 days, so that should be up unless YouTube decides to play some shenanigans again. Uh, it should be up this Saturday. Uh, reminder, we now have swag. We now have a merchandise store. So you could go to statuscoup.com, statuscoup.com, where you will see, hold on, at the top, you'll see our store. Click on our store. 
and it'll redirect you to a pretty fly merchandise store. We've already seen people purchasing. We got the shirts for the men and the ladies. We got iPhone covers. We have cover covers for your Samsung Galaxy, covers for your iPad, covers for your laptop, stickers, posters, canvas prints, artboard prints, the throw pillows, floor pillows, coffee mugs, clocks, uh, tote bags, zipper pouches, drawstring bags, stickers, greeting cards, special notebooks, hardcover journals, and we will be adding more as we go. This is another important way for us to add revenue to the company. We're trying to grow our revenue through membership. Again, become a member, statuscoup.com slash join. I'm not going to lie to you. We've been flat for a few days. We'd like to grow that. You can become a member as low as 5 to $10 a month. And becoming a member right now, you will be invited tonight to our members call starting at 7.30 Eastern. So a little bit after this live stream, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. Uh, if you're a member or a patron, any level, you'll get an invite to join us. It's, a, it's through Zoom and it's our video monthly call. So looking forward to that. Uh, and always remember, folks, always remember, we are here. Most people are not lacking compassion. Most people don't have any earthly idea what is going on in this country. Make sure you go to statusgoo.com. Make sure you click on the story I read to you earlier today that we broke on basically the new finance chair is a mega donor. The new finance chair of the DNC is a mega donor to Hillary Clinton and Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And as far as we know, we don't know if he's donated to Joe Biden's campaign right before he became finance chair. How's that for neutrality? So read it and share it. Go to status, go at status coup on Twitter. Retweet it if you haven't. At status coup, it's at the top of our Twitter and share it with your friends. We need to get this out. Progressives, Sanders supporters, Gabbard supporters, just people who care about democracy and fairness should be sharing and sounding the alarm on the DNC, not so suddenly tilting the playing field again. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tonight if you're a member, and I'll see you tomorrow.